Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 1.30 or the 2.30 panel, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, I'm really excited to introduce a fantastic lineup this afternoon. Um, I My first role is simply to introduce our panelists, and then uh, I will reintroduce um, our second panelist in between the two talks. Um, my name is Kasia Sader. I am an assistant professor of media studies at the New School. Joining us today is our Beans Velosi and Paisley Curra. Beans Velosi is a historian of sex, science, and classification. They are an assistant professor in the Department of History and Sociology of Science, core faculty in the program on gender, sexuality, and women's studies, and a faculty affiliate of the IDOS LGBT Plus Health Initiative at the University of Pennsylvania. Their first book, Binary Logic, The Power of Incoherence in American Sex Science, is under contract with Duke University Press. It argues that sex as a classification system and male and female as categories work precisely because multiple conflicting enactments of them exist simultaneously. I think we're going to hear about that today. Velocy's work has been published in Transgender Studies Quarterly, Historical Studies in Natural Sciences, the American Naturalist and Cell, among others, and has received several accolades, including the Margaret Rossiter History of Women in Science Prize, the John D'Amelio LGBTQ History Dissertation Award, and the Committee on LGBT History Gregory Sprague Prize. Next, we'll hear from Paisley Curra. Um, Paisley Curra is a professor of Women and Gender Studies and Political Science at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center of City, at, or sorry, Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He was a founding co-editor of TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly. Curra's prize-winning 2022 book, Sex Is As Sex Does, Governing Transgender Identity, reveals the hidden logics that have governed sex classification policies in the United States. His new book project situates the current wave of trans legis anti-trans legislation in the United States within a longer history of the regulation of gender. Kura's public-facing work has appeared in the Boston Review, the New York Review of Books, Nature, and the Yale Review. Uh, in 2024 to 2025, he will be a fellow at Princeton Institute, at the Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study. So, as I said, v Beans Velosi will go first, speaking on emphasis on variable, a history of sex in biological science. Hey, thanks, Cassius. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, first, how sex works as a classification system, uh, because it doesn't make any sense, and what that means for efforts to be more precise about what it is. Um, so first, I'm going to briefly sketch out how multiple meanings of sex and attempts to gain clarity around them are, in the present, uh, causing some problems, as we have heard throughout the day so far. Um, and I'm going to then use several historical examples to il uh, illuminate how we got here um, and how this kind of current problem is indicative of a feature rather than a bug in sex classification as a system and as a concept. These will draw on histories of zoology, uh, early studies of heredity and genetics, um, and clinical practice. And then lastly, I'll use that history to complicate some uh, contemporary efforts to find clarity in what sex is. So, okay, part one. So I'm sure by now uh, you've all encountered <laughs> this policy, but in case you're kind of just now tuning in or, or this is new to you, um, in 2016, the NIH uh, instituted a policy that was intended to correct a long history um, of health research that had excluded women due to its excessive focus um, on one hand, uh, male animals and male humans, um, as well as on cells. And the policy requires that NIH funded research factor sex into research design and analysis. Um, and the policy is particularly uh, invested in sex-based comparisons. It's an admirable goal, um, but it's also one that introduces some of its own problems. Um, and the important part by it now, um, this is what I have on the screen, is the definition of sex deployed by this policy, um, which is sex is a biological variable defined by characteristics encoded in DNA, such as reproductive organs and other physiological and functional characteristics. Um, the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health uh, breaks that down a bit further in this uh, diagram from their website uh, on a page that's explaining the importance of the sex as a biological variable policy. Um, and 
as you can see, it separates sex and gender, right? On one side, you have sex, which is described as the biological variable, and that includes anatomy, physiology, genetics, hormones. On the other side, gender, named as a so social and cultural variable, um, and that includes identity, roles and norms, relations, and power. In practice, of course, as I think we have, again, seen throughout today, um, things get a bit fuzzier. So the NIH policy document recommends that authors look at guidance uh, from Cell and The Lancet as they're thinking about what this policy means for their research. Um, and the two journals have identical guidelines, which state, in human research, the term sex carries multiple definitions. It often refers to an umbrella term for a set of biological attributes associated with physical and physiological features, for example, chromosomal genotype, hormonal levels, or internal and external anatomy. It can also signify a sex categorization, uh, most often designated at birth, sex assigned at birth, based on a newborn's visible external anatomy, right? So you can already see that there's a lot packed into whatever this thing called sex is. Because of this multiplicity, uh, both journals advise that authors basically say what they mean by sex. Um, they suggest authors should describe the methods they use to gather and report sex-related and or gender-related data, for example, self-report or physician report, specific biological attributes, current sex slash gender, sex assigned at birth, et cetera, and discuss the potential limitations of those methods. So taking all of this together, uh, sex starts to seem like maybe it's not particularly straightforward, right? It's supposedly this really important research variable, but mostly it seems like all we can say about it is that it's, you know, it's biological and it's, it's different than gender, um, but also it's a bunch of different stuff. Um, and it's not a single variable, despite being called a biological variable. So we all need to be thinking about it, but there's so much uncertainty around it. And to the, to the point that everyone needs to say exactly what their definition of sex is, because both the presum presumption that goes into this uh, guidance and you know, evidence that we can see uh, in a wide range of scientific and medical work is that not everyone's definition of sex uh, is the same. And so I want to pause here to validate your confusion, your frustration, and your sense that something is not quite right here. It's hard to figure out what sex is because sex isn't just one thing, right? This is kind of obvious. It's what the NIH and Cell and The Lancet are saying. But I want to emphasize from my position as a historian and as an STS scholar, that this isn't just you know, multiple perspectives on the same thing, or that if we can cut through all of this bias and imprecision and figure it out well enough once and for all, we can finally find the truth about what sex is. I'm sorry to say, but there is no what sex is. And scientists have known this for a long time. As Frank Lilly, uh, one of the founders of the study of embryology and a you know, generally kind of big deal, well-respected scientist said in 1939, there's no such biological entity as sex. What Lilly meant here um, is that what's referred to as sex has way too many moving parts to be thought of or referred to as just one thing. So Lilly and I, you know, differ in many of our approaches um, and conclusions, but I think what he said in 1939 remains really relevant. Sex is not one thing. There's only a constellation of traits and processes that people have made decisions to clump together as a purportedly singular thing. This is something that we implicitly know, right? This is why the sex is biological variable policy needs so much explanation and explication of what sex is, and yet it doesn't really clear anything up. So the question that animates my own research is how, despite copious evidence to the contrary, did sex come to be seen as a single biological entity? Um, and the answer is that sex, rather, sorry, a lot of work has gone into making sex seem coherent even as research depends on its multiplicity, on its being multiple things.
So part two, shifting into some historical examples. So the scientists that I work on um, had extensive fights about what constituted femaleness or maleness, um, and indeed whether sex is binary at all. And all of that kind of gets forgotten when we think of sex as purely biological. So just one example of this, um, in the late 19th and early 20th century, scientists became extremely interested in the phenomenon of the free martin, um, or what we'd now probably call intersex cows. Um, so free martins are the co-twins of bulls um, who are born with what scientists at the time uh, would refer to as ambiguous sexual characteristics. And different scientists uh, made an array of arguments about what the free martin really was. Was it what they called a true hermaphrodite? Was it a male that had somehow been modified in utero? Was it actually a female that had similarly been modified in some way? Different researchers made their case based on different attributes and what they considered most important for defining sex. Some made claims based on external anatomy, others on the type of gonadal tissue that they found upon dissection, um, others upon uh, the presence or absence of spermatozoa, um, and ultimately, as we'll see, uh, the hormones present in a particular specimen. And so all of this resulted in a lot of mental gymnastics about what might be included in male or female, right? Because clearly not all of this is going to match up. In 1917, um, our friend Frank Lilly uh, published a defining article on the subject. He claimed that he had found that free martins were dizygotic twins, uh, with one male and one female zygote, rather than monozygotic twins in which a zygote of one sex had split into two. And this enabled him to argue that the arterial anastomosis connecting the two fetuses resulted in a sharing of blood and hormones and thus masculinized a female fetus. This, uh, Lily and others claimed, um, said something important about sex itself. And this points back, I think, to the a question that someone had in the previous panel um, about the long history of uh, scientists using kind of atypical cases in order to make broader claims. The work on free martins um, took place when the theory of universal bisexuality had gained significant traction in the biological sciences. And this was a different meaning of bisexuality uh, than the one that we use now. So, Early 20th century scientists um, argued that all organisms contained both male and female attributes um, and could therefore be shifted along that spectrum using medico scientific interventions. This theory um, emerged from a kind of uh, nexus of, of different scientific interests in this moment. One is the you know, developments in endocrinology, uh, one is sexology research on sexual inversion. Um, and another is experiments with gonad transplantation. In the case of the free martin, um, we have two different ways of approaching sex then, right? One is this kind of universal bisexuality, very malleable kind of spectrum, right? There's this idea that hormones can influence um, some kind of originary state and then move its characteristics elsewhere. Um, at the same time, though, sex is something that can be defined as either male or female, right? Even Lily, who is insisting on this more uh, spectrum kind of model of sex, can claim uh, that the free martin is actually female. So we can see this coexistence um, in other places as well. Um, and I'm going to shift now into the laboratories uh, or kind of a, a an epicenter of American eugenics uh, based at Cold Spring Harbor, New York. And these are the eugenics record office and the station for experimental evolution. They have, there's a lot of like administrative difference uh, that I can go into. I will skip over it, um, but feel free to ask me about it. So also in the first decades um, of the 20th century, scientists who were at the forefront of research in heredity, um, which at this moment was innately tied uh, to the study of eugenics and, and eugenic policy, um, also created these opposing yet coexisting versions of sex. So one of the main sites um, in my research is, as I noted, uh, the Eugenics Record Office and Station for Experimental Evolution, um, 
both of which were founded by Charles Davenport uh, in the early years of the 20th century. They later became the Carnegie Institution of Washington Department of Genetics and again then later uh, changed their, their sort of makeup and name to the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, which is still with us today. So here, depending on the research questions and aims of particular scientists, as well as what species they were working with, sex could again be malleable or static. It could be binary or not. And across an array of different projects that these scientists were working on, it could be determined by metabolic, chemical, genetic, gametic, behavioral, and all kinds of other traits, as well as used for statistical um, and administrative methods of sorting different kinds of bodies. So one example of this um, is the work of Oscar Riddle. So he worked at the Station for Experimental Evolution uh, from 1912 to 1945, and he was one of the uh, aforementioned researchers working on uh, gonad transplants, kind of just seeing what would happen, right? So he experimented um, on what he called sex reversal in pigeons um, through an injection of what he referred to as testicular extract. Um, and in doing so, he was able to display that he that by doing this injection, he was able to change the mating behavior um, and secondary sex characters, um, as he called them, of the birds that he was experimenting on. Um, and that work that he did led his boss, uh, Charles Davenport, a biologist and you know big wig eugenicist, to argue that, quote, sex in general is a much less fixed and precise state than is commonly supposed. So sex was not a static thing in Riddle's research. But for research that was tracking the heredity of all kinds of different traits at the eugenics record office, sex had to be binary and static in order to figure out the results of male-female dyadic pairings. So the image here um, is a detail from a pamphlet that the ERO provided to volunteers who wanted to submit uh, family history information uh, for analysis. The ERO primarily represented and analyzed uh, heredity data through pedigree charts, as you can see here, um, which used uh, and, and you can see this kind of to the uh, left of the screen, circles to represent female and squares to represent male, right? And that was the kind of epitome of a, of a single person on a pedigree chart. They were their definitive sex. There was nothing malleable here. Um, a use of sex like riddles would have interfered in this project, which kind of necessarily required um, these kind of very concrete sex categories for the analysis of really large quantities of data. At the same time, the ERO was also deeply concerned um, that the sterilization that they were recommending through their eugenics work would cause masculinization in women, right? They had seen that sex was malleable um, based on a lot of existing research um, both of the, the stuff like Oscar Riddle's work, as well as um, just kind of broader developments in gynecology, uh, like the existence of ovariotomy, which was, you know, another thing that I can talk about the extensive history of, um, right? But the point here is that these scientific projects were all able to exist because they simultaneously made sex different things. They couldn't have actually functioned with one agreed upon definition. And that brings us to our last historical example, uh, which this time features the coexistence of different models of sex in the work of one single doctor. Robert Latou Dickinson uh, was an American obstetrician and gynecologist, as well as a sexologist, birth control advocate, and no surprise, eugenicist. Um, and his very high profile career spanned the turn of the 20th century um, he was, you know, kind of one of these major figures in American sexology um, at the turn of the 20th century and really into the 1930s and early 1940s. And he argued throughout much of his work um, that sex was kind of a matter of difference of degrees rather than kind. Um, and yet, throughout his clinical practice, he ignored the evidence of variation and his own theoretical model in favor of keeping women in a static category. 
right, despite their bodies conforming to precisely the descriptions of intersex bodies that Dickinson had wrote about elsewhere. Um, the women who crossed the threshold of his office were never recategorized as anything other than women. So this diagram is just kind of one example of how Dickinson was thinking of sex as not an either or binary. So we have this kind of V-shaped diagram um, that represents how different bodies have different sex intensities, as Dickinson called them. So for Dickinson, sex was less of a spectrum, um, you know, going from male to female and rather something that a body can have more or less of, right? So full feminine endowment and complete virility, as you can see um, on this diagram, are the highest intensity of sex. Then we go to the mannish woman and the effeminate man. And then finally, neuters with the lowest sex intensity. Dickinson argued that the vast majority of people fell somewhere between fully male or fully female. Um, he says multiple times throughout his work that intersex traits are incredibly common. And yet, that model of sex does not appear in his clinical practice. Um, so in this excerpt from a case history of which there are many, um, this is just kind of one example that I picked somewhat at random. Um, right? Dickinson refers to a patient who is a well-to-do young woman, and then a few lines later refers to her funnel-shaped male pelvis. But having a male pelvis doesn't keep her from being a woman. There are many, many examples of this. Similarly, um, Dickinson's work on labial hypertrophy, which is its own incredibly thrilling and bizarre story. Um, Dickinson wrote about uh, clitoral enlargement in a bunch of otherwise normal white women. And these women had, quote, the male form of the glands, but they were not, not women. There's a lot I can say um, about Dickinson's reasoning here, but the main relevant thing is that even within the work of a single researcher, sex could be nearly opposite things. Dickinson's more theoretical work produced malleable sex of degrees rather than kind, but recategorizing anyone as not a woman was unthinkable in his clinical practice. So in all of these examples, we have scientists creating different iterations of sex. And you might say, you know, well, some of them are, are just wrong. But I invite you to return to sex as a biological variable in the context of this history. So that leads us to part five, uh, some future directions. So if we do that, if we kind of revisit the sex as a biological variable policy in light of this history, I think we have to ask ourselves whether calling sex biological really makes sense. Sex is a thing that varies depending on who's using it as and how. So sex is certainly enacted as if it's biological, right? It's the thing that both in science and more broadly is referred to when we want to say something is natural or inherent to the body. There's certainly an idea that there's one thing called sex uh, that can operate as what the NIH calls a biological variable. As a historian, though, it looks like there's a, an awful lot of work that has to happen in order to keep that idea from falling apart. What the history that I work on demonstrates is that the idea that sex is a thing had to be created, and it was created under specific historical circumstances, some of which uh, may be apparent with the references to eugenics scattered throughout this presentation, but there are many, many other social factors as well. So what does this mean in practice? For one, uh, trying to split sex neatly from gender perpetuates the idea that sex just exists out there as a thing, uh, rather than being produced, right? The current sex as a biological variable guidance frames them as separate, right? Again, uh, repeating this kind of from the first slide, sex is a biological variable defined by characteristics encoded in DNA, such as reproductive organs and other physiological and functional characteristics. Gender refers to social, cultural, and psychological traits linked to human males and females through social context. But sex here ends up pre-existing social and cultural influence in a way that simply isn't borne out when attending to the history of sex in the biological sciences. If sex were only a biological variable, 
or if we treat sex rather as if it were only a biological variable, we can't see all of the ways that it, like gender, is socially constructed. And I don't think that there's much hope for accurate, reproducible scientific research without the historical context that one of its main variables is extremely variable both in the history of sex and in the present. I don't think there's any reason to believe uh, that sex is less variable in the present than it was in the early 20th century. So to make that more concrete, um, in addition to the sex as a biological variable policy, um, a primary recommendation right now for increasing diversity in research is a two question approach to collecting sexual orientation and gender identity data. That is, According to Cell and the Lancet's guidelines, uh, when asking about gender and sex, researchers should use a two-step process. One, ask for gender identity, allowing for multiple options. And two, if relevant to the research question, ask for sex assigned at birth. This is aimed at inclusion just like the sex as a biological variable policy, but it performs the same oversimplification sex becomes solely biological. This is in part a problem because of a lot of assumptions that it makes about transness and cisness um, and many other things I can say more about. But in terms of even just research design and analysis, sex assigned at birth is supposed to be meaningful here. But it's not actually clear what it's supposed to mean. Um, what are we supposed to assume about bodies based on sex assigned at birth? And what definition, whose definition, of sex is being used. So I don't have um, time to go into this in detail, but I'm just throwing this slide uh, up here in case anyone wants to uh, you know, take a screenshot and come back to it later. Um, Shana Stites and I just published a piece on exactly this issue um, of what scientists think they're measuring with the answers to these questions. And what we wind up arguing in that piece is that mostly these questions just kind of assume that there are inherent physiological male and female differences rather than a variety of social factors um, which appear as sex differences, but we might ask about those social factors rather than just assume that there's sex differences. So this is what I wanna leave you with. Most of the offered solutions to these problems, both that I've mentioned um, as well as a bunch of other research across scientific and medical fields, recommend specifying what researchers mean by sex and how they ascertained it in order to do more accurate, more reproducible research. This is one step, um, but it's a very small band-aid. I don't think precision is enough, right? The last 150 years of sex research has been about increasing precision, and scientists have repeatedly expounded in great detail upon their various theories of sex and what they mean by sex and where it's gotten us is this present mess. But this mess, um, and this is kind of my big takeaway, isn't something that we can just kind of get to go away. The mess is what sex is. Incitements to just say what we mean run the risk of ignoring all of this history as well as the problems plaguing research uh, involving sex that go beyond vagueness as a problem, right? So for example, we might consider uh, some of the bigger problems in science, uh, such as the influence of a social world that operates as though sex is a binary biological truth, um, and the way that we're all conditioned to just fully ignore evidence that doesn't fit into that scheme. This is also a problem of um, infrastructure as well, right, that makes it kind of difficult to question sex conceptually and limits the kinds of interventions and innovations that scientists can make, right? In large part because of the sex as a biological variable policy um, where NIH funding is dependent on framing uh, sex in uh, binary static terms. Um, so that's what I've got for you. I look forward to your questions. Um, thanks for tuning in. Thank you so much, Dr. Bellisi. That was a really engaging talk. I learned a lot, uh, especially about animal science and how it relates to human science. Really, really fascinating stuff. Um, next, we're going to hear from Paisley Kura. His talk is entitled Contradictions in Legal Definitions of Sex. So we're going to hear a lot about contradictions. OK, so um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I am. I am a non-scientist and I don't 
even study science. So one thing that means is I have like no slide game. So <laughs> forgive me for that. Uh, I did try. I tried. Let's see here if I can get it to work. Okay. So I'm going to just jump um, jump in. But the one one thing I want to say when I, as I start is that when I use the word sex in this talk and in my research on law and policy, I define sex. I don't refer to any particular configuration of gametes and gonads and genitals and XX and XY. I define sex as the decision as to whether one is M or F or possibly X is a non-binary, a decision that's backed by the force of law. So I define sex as a decision of the state. And hopefully by the time I finish this talk, that will that that methodological kind of leap on my part will make will make sense to you. So I want to just jump in with this quote. And this is what kind of got me interested in thinking about the problem of sex classification. This is uh, from like over 20 years ago, it was like a hearing in New York City about a non-discrimination bill. Um, and I know I'm not going to be like our students and read my entire slide to you, but I'm going to read this, this quote. Um, she said, I do not suffer from gender dysphoria. I suffer from bureaucratic dysphoria. My ID does not match my appearance. I worry every time I apply for a job, every time I authorize a credit card check, every time I buy a plane ticket, every time I buy a beer at the corner deli. I've changed my name, but my gender continues to be officially and bureaucratically M. And what, um, what I'm interested in here is the disjunction, um, the disjunction between the state's decision of what sex you are and your own. And clearly this is something that like it becomes most, this disjunction is, is a situation that like transgender people find ourselves in. Like where one, one sense of oneself is male or female or non-binary does not match the, the, the M or the F on your, on your uh, identity document or the binary codes and the social security records. Um, so I was interested in this disjunction because clearly um, I'm a political scientist, but truthfully, I'm a political theorist. So we're sort of, we care about normative questions of justice. So the um, the disjunction about sex classification kind of creates some harms in terms of you know what we might call recognition, and also in terms of like just being able to negotiate one's one's life uh, as that trans woman was testifying before the committee, just kind of moving through the airport, moving moving um, moving through life. So. Um, I think this is a pretty um, uh, sophisticated audience, but a lot of people have the sense that there's this legal, this category of legal sex, like, oh, what's your legal sex? It's like, even my health clinic, which is very state-of-the-art LGBT health clinic, asked me what my legal sex is on some form. Um, but of course, there's no once and for all legal sex, right? Um, one sex, it depends on what agency, what judges, what agencies one dealing with, what, what judge was it one is in front of. So, you know, the same person could have an M on their passport, an F for their driver's license, an M on their birth certificate, be housed in a woman's shelter, be housed in the trans unit of the New York City jail. Sometimes it exists and sometimes it doesn't. Um, be housed in a men's prison upstate, be classified as M for selective service. So there's all these contradictions. So there's not one single, um, single once and for all legal sex across time or place. Okay, so here's what I wanna to do today. I'm gonna to spend most of my time <clears throat> on this New York City policy reforms around birth certificates. It's like a case study and all the different shifts and uh, permutations of that story kind of illustrate uh, one, of my, one of my arguments about sex. Then I'm gonna go into some larger um, constructions of sex outside of New York City and, and explain the contradictions that way. And then if there's time at the end, I'm just gonna talk about some new shifts in the use of sex reclassification policies. Okay, so, forward here. Um, okay, so New York City changed its birth certificate policy about sex classification five times in 50 years. It's like a lot of shifts. Uh, and the shifts got closer and closer together in time. And I'm not gonna go through I'm not going to go through all those shifts. I'm going to spend most of my time, you know, around 19, you know, talking about the policy in 1971, the policy in 2006. Um, so don't worry about that. But if you are interested, you can find um, a recounting more detail in a piece in the New York Review of Books 
which I have liberated from the paywall if you just go to my webpage, which I'll, I'll put that at the end. Um, I hope that's okay, <laughs> it's liberated. Okay, so in 1971, New York City, which for weird historical reasons is its own jurisdiction for birth certificates, usually it's states, but in New York, New York, it's like New York City has its own policy and New York, the rest of New York has its own policy. And at one point I talked to the head administrative lawyer for the city of New York and she couldn't even explain why, just some weird contingencies of history. Anyways, in 1971, the city decided that its birth certificate policy, which was not to issue new birth certificates to what they were calling transsexual people was, um, was not very kind. So they, I think they got a letter from the New York Civil Liberties Union and they're like, okay, we're gonna change our policy because their policy had just been a flat out no. So the policy they instituted in 1971 said we will give people who are born in New York City a new birth certificate if the applicant supplies detailed, a detailed surgical operative report as proof of undergoing convertive surgery. Convertive surgery is this New York City word around sex classification. I don't know where else it comes from. Um, the applicant would also have to undergo a post-operative examination signed by a physician and attesting to the fact that surgical change has taken place. So different doctor. The applicant would also have to supply a post-operative psychiatric evaluation signed by a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist. And then they would get a new birth certificate. And this is back in the day when of course, there's no, no insurance companies or state policies would cover gender affirming care. But if, they, if, it, if someone met all those criteria, then they would get a new birth certificate. But this is the kicker. This is the birth certificate they would get. And I don't know if you can see, but what's missing on this birth certificate is a box for sex. So they would get a new birth certificate that didn't list their sex. And the city thought this is as far as we could go. This is, we're not gonna go any further than this. So they won't have the birth sex on the birth certificate, but they will have this kind of genderless birth certificate. And to make matters worse, at the bottom it says, this certificate is filed pursuant to subsection five or subsection A, blah, blah, blah. That's basically the transsexual part of the New York City health code. So for any individual who looks at birth certificates all day, like people who work in human resources or bureaucrats, state bureaucrats, this is clearly the birth certificate of a trans person. So by 2000, and, by 2000 and five or so, the city was sort of embarrassed by this policy because what had been a sort of considered a benevolent policy in 1971, by 2005 was seen as sort of embarrassing because most jurisdictions in the country by that time allow people to change their birth certificates. And some jurisdictions allow people to change their birth certificates and didn't put in place this barrier of like what the city officials were calling convertive surgery. But what they, by convertive sur surgery, they basically meant genital surgery. So the city convened a committee of experts. Well, a committee, I don't know if they're experts. They convened a committee of people. So there are folks from the New York City Department of Health and um, Human and Mental Hygiene. Uh, there are trans healthcare professionals. There were healthcare professionals who had trans clients. They weren't exactly considered allies. Uh, and then I was on the committee as, as well as a couple of trans rights lawyers. So the committee met a few times in 2005. There was a lot of back and forth. As I recall, the surgeon on the committee was like having against having anything but surgery as a metric for sex reclassification. But as, as we know, when you talk to surgery surgeons, they often think surgery is the answer to everything. But eventually we got um, we got a policy proposal that said New York City is gonna use gender identity as the way to tell if someone is deserves a change of sex on their birth certificate. So the gender identity would have to be backed up by some sort of letter from a healthcare professional, um, but there would be no barriers put into place by um, requiring body modification or surgery. So we were pretty happy with that. And it's like, this wasn't legislation, this was rules and probably getting rules and all that. And then there was this period of quiet for like a year. We were like, what's going on? Why hasn't our policy changed? And then the city officials from the, mental, the Bureau of uh, Health and Mental Hygiene came back to us and they said, actually, we're not gonna go with this gender identity policy. We shopped it around. We shopped it around to different city agencies like we do with any policy. And we had very widely divergent views. 
So the Department of Homeless Services thought it was fine. The Department of Corrections didn't like it. The Human Resources Administration, which dealt with a lot of social benefit policies, didn't like it. So every agency had a different take on the policy. So we decided to table the gender identity policy. We are going to change it slightly so that people who submit all those many things of affidavits of surgery and examinations and psychiatric reports can get a new birth certificate and the birth certificate will have their new, will have their new gender on. There will be a box for sex on it. So that was the policy. And it was a real disappointment because that policy created a huge obstacle for most trans people to change their birth certificate. Um, when they finally reformed it much later, like in 2014, tons of people were able to change their birth certificates. And so at that time I thought, this is just transphobia. The city officials do not care about transgender people. They do not care about the harm. And they just think we're frauds or not legitimate and just trying to harm transgender people. So as I was, I just, you know, then I was writing about this issue and, and digging more into the research. And a few years later, um, the city was sued by a trans rights group, the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, as it was called, sued the city. And they said, your birth certificate policy is mean. So of course, lawyers don't say mean. They said, your birth certificate policy is arbitrary, capricious, and irrational. So basically kind of a equal protection argument, like your birth certificate policy makes no sense in a kind of rational kind of way of doing business for the government. Because in New York State, you can change your driver's license pretty easily. You, you know, trans people can go to homeless shelters, but according to their gender identity, why wouldn't, why would you have a different policy than driver's licenses, for example? So they thought it was arbitrary, capricious, and irrational. And it was when the city lawyers responded in this lawsuit, it was like not the most titillating prose. Um, that's kind of for me when the penny dropped and it made me think like maybe transphobia, which is a good word to explain, to talk about the harms that transgender people face. Maybe it's not the, use, the most useful analytical frame for discovering or figuring out why these policies are in place. So the city lawyers said in some brief, they said the existence of different approaches to similar problems does not render an agency's rule irrational. And the different approaches were different agencies' di plan rules for sex classification. And so like some agencies would not, would never acknowledge that so someone could change their sex. Some would have some surgical barriers. Some would say gender identity. So they're saying the fact that different agencies have different approaches to sex classification doesn't mean that their particular approach is irrational. And that's when I, um, I kind of realized that the penny sort of dropped because the advocates and myself is like a scholar, but also an advocate, we were going in there kind of making arguments in the realm of like Plato, like the only thing that really is gonna make sense in terms of, of, of sex classification is gender identity. This is what gender identity is. This is what sex should really be measured as. And the bureaucrats from the different agencies they were like the true Foucauldians because they didn't care about all these definitions and classifications and literatures. They cared about how a particular definition would change how it did its work. And so, and that's what gummed up the policy from our, our perspective. So it's certainly, you can talk to say it's transphobic, but also there were other logics at, logics at play that required investigation. So this, um, this led me to kind of, um, this is this, the middle part of the talk, this led me to think about um, all the other sex classification policies. So as I was doing this research, I was also trying to keep track of all these different sex classification policies. So I had this crazy Excel chart of all those different states, different agencies in different states, the federal government, different judicial decisions on sex classification. And it was just a jumble, a mismatch of uh, of policies. Sometimes you couldn't change your sex classification. Sometimes you could. Sometimes it would be like gender identity. Sometimes it would be surgery. There are all these different things. And some of these things can't be explained by any logic. Some of them are just contingent, like the, the um, you know, some official had a transgender sister-in-law. So suddenly, you know, they had a good policy. So there's always the messiness of public policy. There's no pure logics all, all the time. Um, but one, one thing I did notice is that driver's license policies, I tried to get a picture of a driver's license, but they all have people's names on them, which seemed wrong. So the driver's license policies 
um, we're much more what we might call progressive or liberal in the sense that almost every state let people change their set classification of the driver's license and states were really much more quick to, to drop barriers, obstacles to sex reclassification like surgery and medical interventions. Um, and I remember uh, I had a, a friend who was doing transgender rights and um, the DMV people, of course, they, ha they have an annual conference. So this, this, this guy, Chris uh, Neeland, uh, no, I forget his last name, Chris went to the, um, the DMV annual conference and I was, we came back, I was like, Chris, what is with the DMV people? Because they're all good trans people. Like, are they all trans? <laughs> yeah, like, what's going on? And he was like, no, they seem nice enough, but just boring kind of bureaucratic people. Because I had been thinking like, maybe maybe DMV people were not less transphobic than other people, but that, that wasn't the answer. So, um, but at the same time that people could more easily change their identity documents and the, the, the barriers to those kind of changes were falling, there was a bunch of case of, cases involving transgender people and marriage. So this is before the ban on same-sex marriage was found to be unconstitutional. So these were marriages in which the trans people who were in them imagined themselves to be in opposite gender marriages. And most of those marriages like ended like as marriages do, like through death or divorce. But once in a while, these marriages would be contested by either the spouse or the ex-spouse, um, always the cisgender ex-spouse or someone else with an interest in the marriage. So um, I have a picture of a marriage, but that's uh, just a, a public domain image. It, it doesn't refer to the case I'm gonna talk to you about. Um, so let me give you an example of a typical kind of trans marriage case. There's this woman named Christy Lee Littleton uh, and she lived in Texas and her husband died. And she and her husband's family were suing her husband's medical caregivers for malpractice. So at some point, the, the medical institution's insurance company, they were going through all the documents and depositions, and they discovered that Christy Lee Littleton was transgender. So they argued in court that because she's transgender, she's really not, she's not female, she's actually male. Therefore, her marriage to, another, to a man, a cisgender man, was a same-sex marriage, which is not valid in the state of Texas. So if she's not married to the fellow, then she has no standing to sue. So she's out of the lawsuit. Um, and an appellate court in, in, in Texas completely agreed with that reading. They said, this is kind of in the language of Texas jurisprudence, they said, um, a surgeon cannot change the scalpel what God created at birth. Christine Littleton was born a man, will always be a man. So the interesting thing with that case and many, almost all the other trans marriage cases that I talk about is that she had done all the stuff. She had changed her birth certificate, her driver's license, probably her passport if she had one. She'd been recognized legally as a female and all, and all these other different agencies. But for the purposes of marriage, um, she was always going to be a female. And this pattern is repeated in all these other cases. There's usually something at stake. Oh, there's always something at stake, either a share of the estate or something like a tort claim or custody of children. And then I began to see some logics in how sex was classified, sex was defined differently by these different, di by according to different state projects. If you think about it, it makes sense. The purpose of an identity document is to establish a relationship between it and the person who carries it. So this has always been a problem of like, the state, since the states got bigger than villages, like how do you keep track of this or that particular person? How do you know who they are? Um, so sex markers, on an, sex markers on an, on an identity document that don't reflect the gender presentation of the person who's carrying it weaken that connection. So in New York State, I think New York State is nice because it lets me change my driver's license. But in fact, in New York State, if a, I get pulled over a speeding ticket and I hand over a driver's license with an F on it, that just creates confusion in terms of like who I am and what I'm doing and what my identity really is. So it's inter in the interest of the state to let people change their sex classification on identity documents. So it's not really surprising that state DMVs were among the first government agencies to let people change, the, change their sex classification and later to, and also to drop requirements like surgery. Because um, the function of DMVs is to kind of track people over a territory. But marriage is a very different state project. You know, we talk about marriage, people found love and bride magazine and all that's all very nice. But really, marriage is a legal instrument to regulate the transmission of property uh, and family relations. Um, so decisions about marriage 
concerns the state state's interest, not in identification, but in distribution, like who gets what. So marriage has always been this instrument of governing that turns some individuals into families and families into nations by regulating social reproduction, inheritance, property ownership. And the work of marriage is, um, is representing the legal and social instrument, or sorry, the legal and social instrument of marriage doesn't really work if, if the kind of curtain is pulled back and it's revealed to not actually be biological. So the presence of a trans person in, in marriage and involving children and inheritance, as one judge in, in um, the European Court of Human Rights said, this will throw centuries of, of like inheritance law into like asunder if we recognize trans people. So that's why trans people were doing very badly when it came to um, when it came to marriages. So just getting to the end of the second part of the talk, then sex is a decision backed by the force of law. That's what that's why I started off defining it. And the contradictions in sex classification policy make more sense if we understand these dissimilar constructions of sex for their different government projects. Various state agencies do different things. Some regulate marriage and families, make decisions about property, track births and deaths, provide residents with identity documents, house the homeless, attend to public health, regulate the professions, ensure the security of air travel, incarcerate populations. Each agency's policy on sex classification, therefore, varies too. Some state agencies will recognize the new sex of anyone requesting the change, some will not, and some will require to put these barriers in place. One's classification has often depended then on how a particular agency sees individuals as workers, as incarcerated people, as parents, as spouses, as students, as voters, or as social service clients. So one of the things we have to understand, because we talk about sex as if it's a thing, well, maybe we don't because you're all very sophisticated. We talk about sex as, as if it's a thing and a state as if it's a thing. But in fact, there's no one state. There's all of these different forces of authority backed by the force of law. And in political science, when we say backed by the force of law, it just means like a decision has comes with some force. So the force might be you go to jail or you pay a fine. Um, so a decision backed by the by the force of law, there's all these different different little state actors out there making their own policies around sex classification. Uh, so there's not one singular sex and there's not one singular state. Okay, so just in the third part of my talk, I just wanna shift to like new uh, ways of, of using sex classification policies um, around what we might call the culture wars and identity politics. So for example, in the last two years, nine states have passed laws that define sex. Sometimes they're called defining sex laws. Sometimes they're called women's bills of rights. Nine states and then in the orange, that's Nebraska, they had an executive order. And what these laws do is they say, sex is gonna be defined uniformly in every state law and regulation. So it always means the same thing. And the, so a couple of the, these laws will say, and if you see the word gender, just just make it mean sex or get rid of it. We're not using the word gender anymore. Um, so here's like, for example, Montana. This was enacted last year. Um, this is very similar because it's all coming from a couple of uh, think tanks to provide this model legislation. So you can see sex is assigned at birth and they define sex in terms of a female is an individual whose biological reproductive system is developed to produce ova. A male means an individual whose biological reproductive system is developed to produce the ova of a female. The one question I have, maybe someone here knows the answer, like why do they say ova of a female? It seems like sort of like a little bit of overkill, but maybe there's some, I'm not, something I'm not getting in there. Um, so these laws, um, when they're, when they're like in, textually, they don't mention transgender people, but in the discussion and the legislative history and the news stories around it, there's lots of discussion of transgender people. What these laws do is they'll, they'll produce kind of the legal erasure of trans people in terms of like being forced to use facilities that are only associated with the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, and also, for example, in uh, Kansas has one of these laws. In Kansas and probably other states are interpreting it to mean like your identity documents will only have your the sex that you were assigned at birth on them. So if someone lives in Kansas and maybe they transitioned 30 years ago and they send off to get their license renewed in the mail. They're going to get something back in the mail with their birth sex on it. 
They're not going to have like their their um their gen they're not going to have their gender identity represented on their driver's license anymore. And this also means that people who apply who have just got a license for the first time are also going to have the birth sex on it. So the earlier logics I described about like it's useful for states to be able to keep track of people have been overwhelmed or overcome by these larger sort of political logics, which we can um, uh, maybe think about. So that's one side of what's going on. Uh, this is just a chart from the trans legislation tracker, which just shows how much all these bill, how much growth there has been in these, this kind of legislation. So this legislation is around sports, around gender affirming care, around bathrooms and pronouns, but at base, all of it's got to do with like what sex you really are. So on the other side of the kind of culture wars, we have what we might call the progressive or the states. So I also want to leave, I also wanted to end by talking about New York City because I did not want to give you the wrong idea about New York City uh, because it now has a policy that is like ideal from my perspective, which is you can change your birth certificate to M, F, or X. Uh, you do not need any supporting letter from a medical professional. There's much less administrative burden. It's just like, it's not a hassle at all. And here is the mayor of the time who is signing this legislation, surrounded by trans advocates. And I'm very happy to see on the far right is Victoria Cruz, who's a veteran of Stonewall riots and a graduate of my college, Brooklyn, Brooklyn College. So this is um, this is the other side of the of the of the what's going on, say, for example, in Kansas and Montana. So before we had sex classification kind of based on agencies, now we have sex classification you know, based on these kind of larger political jurisdictions. And that's like, sex is still an instrument, but not so much of governing in terms of like, but of, of politics. And we can talk about, talk about that uh, maybe in the Q and A if you like. So I just want to kind of um, end by suggesting that so the legislative assault on transgender people in the United States, it seems new, but governments have been regulating the trans, the, the lives of trans people for decades through sex classification policies, from rules for changing one's sex to bans on Medicaid coverage to gender affirming care. Outside of trans communities, hardly anybody were, was aware of these kind of Kafkaesque web of confusing regulations. But now that the policing of the gender binary has been transformed from an unremarkable aspect of bureaucratic policymaking to an element of identity politics and a weapon in the cultural wars, everyone's paying attention. So this is what I wanna leave you with. To reform systems of sex classification, we first need to get to the root of things and understand how it works as a tool of governing and more recently of politics. It's not what sex is that matters, but what it does for particular state and political projects. And it's those projects, not so much sex itself, that we need to interrogate. So you can find, you can find some of the stuff I referred to on my webpage. So thank you very much. Hello, thank you so much for those engaging talks. I really appreciated hearing the two of these um, these two conversations in parallel and thinking about what kind of natural overlaps there might be. Um, we have some questions in the Q&A that have come up. Um, I'm happy to ask those, but if either of you has a question for one another, I might want to ask you <laughs> to go ahead and do that first to take the stage. Um, and if not, I can pass it to the audience. Um, I have a question for Paisley. Um... Which is, I guess, like, what is the relationship between the state and science in the stuff that you're working on, right? Because one of the things that I have seen happening, uh, especially recently, is uh, this kind of, like, these the legislatures that you've talked about are, um, you know, saying, like, science says that sex is binary. Um, so, like, science is being invoked, um, but only kind of in this abstract sort of way so yeah it's really fascinating i just spent like too much time reading the legislative history of the nebraska legislation on defining sex no it was no it was the nebraska legislation on gender affirming care and it's really kind of horrifying because like the people who are trying to ban gender affirming care for youth will say oh we've got some articles here and these legislators will be like oh that's important i should know and the other leaders like well we have a whole bunch of articles here and they they don't have the time or the tools to evaluate how many articles peer-reviewed, you know, they're just like, oh, they've, each side has articles. So it's really, you know, it's, it's really a, a, a crapshoot. But the other thing, and it'll be interesting through the symposium to kind of hear more about is like, 
One thing I think about is like how the Supreme Court, when it was deciding who was white and who was non white in the early part of the 20th century, the racial prerequisite cases, they used to just have this racial idea about this biological idea about race, like oh, the races and so and so. And then, you know, after a while, you get anthropology, you get Franz Boaz, and they're all saying, oh, you know, race is like not really, it's not really a biological thing. And the courts didn't say, oh, okay, it's not really a biological, biological thing. We should sort of drop this Immigration and Naturalization Act stuff around whiteness they said huh science is kind of stupid let's look at what the dictionary says what race is or what common sense is so they see science as a legitimate legitimating discourse until it's not so from my perspective the politics of it matters so much and the science is useful like i have translitigator friends who like just pray for the help they get from all the scientific associations like it's so useful in litigation um, so that's I'm not to downplay it, but the politics of the larger moment have to be something we really pay attention to because it can't just be science because, you know, we have, you know, we can't agree on climate change in this country. So. No, I think that's very helpful. And I, and I wonder, there's a, I think there's a sort of clarifying question here that we can use to jump off from this. And I'm going to circle back to beans in a minute, but, but Paisley, there's a question here that just is simply asking, you know, um, is it true that the legal um, that, that the legal system understands there is a thing that is legal sex? Um, and I wonder if what you're saying is that there isn't one legal system. <laughs> is that what that? Well, yeah, that's also true. I mean, there's definitely not one legal system. Like, there's this case I talk in my book called In Re Helig, and it's this person who like can't change their sex in their home state because it's conservative. So I think they go to Maryland, and the judge is like, "Oh, that's too bad. Like, we'll give a court order changing their sex." And then they read the science. They have 30 pages summarizing the science. They're like, yeah, we'll do a court order. And the very end of the decision, they say, but this is only for like identity documents. For other social functions like marriage, there could be a different decision. So like, what's really interesting, because I kind of come at this as an academic and I read, teach the Foucault lectures every year and I think I'm so smart. <laughs> really, I'm not. Really, the, the bureaucrats and the judges, they understand very much that like sex is like a mobile property of governing. Like that judge in Helic was like, yeah, I'll give her a new person. I'll give her a court order for her, a sex change, but not for marriage. So before there was a before the ban on same sex marriage was unconstitutional. So there's there there are all these little 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 states, and there's a there's a recognition of that. No, I think that's really helpful. And it helps us understand the sort of malleability on multiple scales here, right? This thing we're talking about, about sort of the contextual nature of some of these questions. Um Beans, I think I'm going to ask you a particular question here that's that's coming up that might actually stitch together some of the legal and biological questions. Um, this is a person who has a specific question about how sex and gender are viewed by courts. I don't know if you know that answer, but one one way that this is coming up for this person is things like forensic science, right? Like identifying remains, potentially identifying human identification um, in cases like sexual assault. Like, is are is there a way that that sex might have relevance in some of these? Um, cases that rely on uh, quote unquote biological evidence, right? To understand the force of their meaning in the social. So one other way to think about that is, are there cases in which some kind of sex identification, potentially quote unquote DNA evidence or some other type of biological evidence might be a meaningful piece of data that we should use in the social as it sort of circulates to help us um, I guess administer justice. Is it, can you think of cases in which that could be could be true? Yeah, this is a great question. I honestly can't, um, and I'm I'm sure that that there will be a lot of like, but what what about this particular um, situation? But um, I mean, I, and I have several thoughts here that are kind of all competing um, for for primacy. But I mean, I guess the first thing I'll say is like it's and, and Paisley, this I think goes to to what you were saying too about like identification as being like matched to a particular person um like sex doesn't actually narrow things down very much right like if if you have a binary system that's like you know whatever like roughly 50 50 i know that there are all kinds of things about sex ratios whatever um right but that doesn't actually like narrow things down very much to be able to identify a particular person uh first of all um second of all um, a lot of, at least from, from what I know, and, and to be fair, I'm like not an expert in this, but when it comes to like forensic science, for example, a lot of the attempts to, um, determine sex based on, you know, for example, like skeletal remains, um, 
aren't actually very reliable. Um, they tend to, um, and I'm thinking here um, about, you know, kind of skull measurements, stuff like that. I actually took my um, students to the Mütter Museum um, here in Philadelphia um, a semester or two ago. And that was a significant part of the presentation um, of like the, the presenter kind of showed different, um, different skulls and tried to give the students the tools that forensic scientists would use um, to make a decision about what sex they were. Um, and it was wildly inaccurate, right? And not just because my students were, you know, uh, college first years, um, but because it's all incredibly um, based in a set of norms that are not actually very applicable um, to individuals, right? Even if, um, and I can talk a lot about the kind of statistical construction of sex, but even if we say, okay, even like there are, are exceptions to all of this, but statistically speaking, we can say that if a skull has these particular dimensions in these particular places, we're going to put it in this category. Um, there is a lot of skulls that that would not apply to because that is the entire point of statistical analysis, right? Um, so, yeah, I think I think the kind of um, you know, what if what if we don't know your sex if you're in a medical accident or in, a, in an accident and need medical care, whatever, that's often a kind of gotcha thing of we shouldn't let people change their IDs because what if the ER doctor doesn't know if they have ovaries or not? And it's just like the vast majority of time, um, a, a, an either or sex classification doesn't actually give you the information that you need. Yeah, no, I think that's that's exactly right. Because the, the idea of sex as a biometric identifier is based on this assumption of a binary model. But the binary model is not an input, it's like an output. So there's this great piece by Gerard Noyel in this old, well, old, young, whatever, this 2001 book called Documenting Individual Identity. And it's about birth registration in France. And they basically pass some sort of policy like, you had to carry the baby that was just born to the magistrate to show the baby to the magistrate who could look at it and, and decide and write down its parents and its sex. And the doctor was like, it's going to get cold. We'll just say what it is. But they wanted to know if it was male or female. And it's, I'm not saying male or female kind of pre-exist, but like Napoleon in 15 years need to know how many people he can come back and pick up from that village for his armies, right? So so there had to be this some group of people who were classified as something and we could, had to keep track of them. Um, so yeah, it's important not to kind of get bought into the, to, to the logic of the state's recognition because those, those, those recognitions are always for, for something not, not so useful. <laughs> like, like the military, is that what you're yeah. saying? <laughs> or like the idea of sort of like um, sorting people into categories for the use, right? To your point, the point of your, the book, your book title, the usage is the question we should be asking, right? Not whether or not there's some sort of like primi like primacy underneath of that. Um, we're getting a couple of questions that sort of, sort of relevant to that about the sort of value overall of tracking sex. Um, I think some of this is, is speaking to some of the things that Beans has already talked about, about how we imagine there is some kind of um, truth claim inherent in sex categorization that actually isn't doing as much as we think to try to narrow down the possibilities of individual identification. I think that's definitely true in Paisley's work as well. Um, and so I wonder if you can sort of think with me about the value of tracking these categories at all. Should we be eliminating, you know, a sort of sex box, uh, you know, on maybe medical or legal forms? Um, is there some way to articulate what we mean by sex in a way that, you know, bends us more towards justice or more towards, I would say, accuracy, right? These questions. Um, so are we are we interested in sort of um, deconstructing this to the point of irrelevancy or is there are there other forms of language or structures we should use to try to communicate some of this data in the sort of narrow relevant situations in which it emerges? I don't care who takes that first. You figure it out yourself. Well, I can start because I have, um, and Beans can probably say something a lot more thoughtful, but um, yes, I'm sure of course, we don't need to track sex like in the future, but like if we look at what happened in New York City, I didn't have time to get into this, but like New York City only changed its birth certificate policy after the state ended the ban on same-sex marriage. Then they didn't care. So one of the things we have to recognize is like sex classification is baked into the legal architecture because it used to be used to make sure that men got more stuff than women. 
And now transgender people have really benefited from old fashioned second wave liberal feminism because as the state got out of the business of telling, uh, of making distinction between men and women in terms of kind of rights and resources, it wasn't so, wasn't so important to make sure that people didn't cross those barriers. But it's still culturally a significant thing. So when de Blasio changes his policy, which is great, we have this lovely policy, trans people, trans New York, transgender New Yorkers need to have this policy of being able to change their stuff. He doesn't change the New York City Health and Human Health and Hospitals Corporation's birth certificate policy. So when a kid, when an infant is born, boom, they still get an M or an F because he can't send parents from Bay Ridge home with a baby that doesn't have a sex classification because that would be even for New York, that would be that would be too much. So these these kind of they, these they do hang on in a kind of sed sedimented way. Um, but I'll, I'll pass it over to Beans. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I have two answers here and one one is like i'm i'm not in the business of practical solutions <laughs> um right and so on, on one hand like pays i completely completely agree with you that like to actually um implement you know getting rid of sex as a category which like i would love i would really really love that um right i am not in fact sure why anyone needs a sex slash gender marker on their license um again it is not really narrowing anything down particularly well. Um, at the same time, I think um, one of the things that I, I kind of do see in my role as a historian specifically is kind of doing the like, it doesn't have to be this way um, kind of move. Um, and so I guess what I'll say about that um, is that like sex as we think about it now and we in a kind of general sense, um, is really recent. Um, I, you know, like in just like to, to really go back to a medieval context, um, for example, right? Uh, Old English, for example, does not have a word for sex. Um, there is not a word for man, um, as in like male. There are kind of relational terms um, for, you know, someone who is a sword bearer um, and interpret that how you will. Um, the words for women, again, there's not really a word for women, there's wife, there's daughter, there's widow, all of that. Um, but there's not this kind of um, biomedical sort of assumption of body equals category, right? There's actually, in a weird way, kind of a much um, greater emphasis on sociality than we have now. Um, so on one hand, there's that, right? There's this kind of deep history or deeper history sense um, of sex is relatively new. And then there's the specificity of the ways in which sex is relatively new, um, which is that like the, the medical and scientific approach to sex that we have inherited um, is born out of the 19th century um, in particular contexts of um, the development of industrial agriculture um, and that kind of accompanying political economy um, you know, for breeding purposes, which then transitions into eugenics. Um, the, you know, first American eugenicists are very much the people who are members of the American Breeders Society, um, who are coming from their background, um, you know, in raising horses, in, in raising cows, whatever. Um, they're the ones who are experts in what sex is. Um, they're also the experts in heredity. Um, so when you have the development of genetics and when you have the development of sex science kind of in the, the last decades of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, um, those are the motivations for learning things about sex. Um, and this kind of goes back to this question of what is sex being used for? Um, and I have, I don't think I've ever heard of it, like, I don't know of a historical example in which like sex is used for something good, um, right? Sometimes it's used like you know, in the, there was, I think one of the comments um, was asking about um, like sexual assault cases. Um, and right in that case, the, the category woman is sometimes used to try to correct a, a sexed problem that was itself kind of caused by this history um, of, you know, patriarchal um, white supremacist garbage, um, right? But in the development of sex science, um, you know, if maybe we could talk a little bit about like some of the origins of sexology in trying to 
kind of uh, counter legal arguments, uh, you know, that against sodomy by being like, no, it's not my fault. This is a natural thing. Um, but yeah, other than that, like, I'm I'm not confident that we need sex for very much at all. Yeah, I mean, I think I think people are kind of are doing the game that you're discussing, right? Trying to come up with these examples, right? Like maybe in certain lab orders or results, right? Like I guess if I wanted someone to figure out if my testosterone levels, well, even then they'd just still be looking at averages and they'd be matching them to other people's, right? <laughs> who are sort of right. in the category of people who have testosterone levels of a certain type. So yeah. because testosterone levels aren't binary. <laughs> Right. I'm just, I'm trying to think of when would I want someone to know my sex assigned at birth? Well, in, I, I in think, context. yeah, I think we should get away from sex assigned at birth and just talk like much more specific, granular information about people's bodies mm -hmm. and not make these large things. Like just to give a personal example, I go to this health clinic. I don't like the feel of it. I don't like the provider. So I don't say anything about being trans, but I have like a urinary infection and it turns out kind of matters. <laughs> And I get the wrong antibiotics and I get all screwed up. Yes. And then, you know, so like, but like, so it, it but, it, but like sex is not the right answer. It's kind of like, what kind of, what's the history of your body? I think there's this issue of Cell Magazine. I think Isabel's going to talk about tomorrow that I think it's Madeline Pape's piece talks about like, just like using women is like seeing how many women have uterine cancer, right? And uh, if you, if you describe, if you don't, if you measure women and not people with uteruses, you actually undercount the prevalence of uterine cancer in black women. It's going to do with transgender people. Like, so it's always going to be because black women have high history, higher rate of hysterectomies. So it's got like this, this kind of context, sex contextualism, which I'm sure is on the agenda at some point, um, is just so important to kind of to think about in terms of granulated and very small scale, but for sure. Yeah, and I think there's also a kind of um, rhetorical move um, also that I think is important, which like I've, cause I've, I've had this conversation or, or ones like it kind of a number um, of times that are kind of like, but what if we need sex per, for this particular thing? Um, and people kind of try to come up with, with examples of like, oh, I need, we need sex for, for this particular experimental purpose for this epidemiological purpose, whatever the case may be. Um, I'm curious what would happen if we just like swapped that question of like, what would happen if instead of everyone jumping to what if we need sex for this very narrow case um, of being like, what are the things that we don't need sex for? Like that might be a much longer list. Um, and I wonder how that would kind of shift some of these conversations, right? And that's kind of how I often see like my role in these kinds of conversations is to like almost say something that's like, so, right it, it's not practical it's it, it might sound completely ridiculous for me to be like no we don't need sex and like sure there probably are instances in which we do but there are far more people saying that we need sex for those reasons than people saying that we don't so i would rather just like throw it out there and see what people do with it and kind of give permission to just like just consider it just consider what would happen if we got rid of it maybe it wouldn't work but like what we're doing now is definitely not working so Maybe yeah, we just can consider to, something else. I just to kind of add on to that, like these defining sex laws define women by their reproductive capacity, which is like not the most feminist position we want to we want to be in. But in terms of like Shamita Descupta's comment in there, um, we can still make arguments about discrimination and sexism and misogyny. Just like you don't have if 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 I'm discriminated against because I'm that my employer thinks I'm like Buddhist and I'm not, I still have a discrimination claim. Like the fact that you get it wrong, it's kind of like, so, and we can also, we can also kind of keep track of misogyny and still have anti-misogynist policies without having a kind of a sex as a sign of birth um, understanding of, of, of gender. Cause that actually gets, gets away from understanding how misogyny operates. Yeah. I can also, I feel like I can probably guarantee that like just with discrimination cases as an example, like I don't think anyone's employer is being like, do you have large gametes or small gametes, right. right? Like the ways that sex is actually enacted in any kind of bureaucratic or social or other, you know, other kind of relation of power um, is totally divorced, I think, from whatever, um, you know, kind of narrower scientific definition one might want to have. Um, because, you know, also, I don't think anyone's employer for the most part is like going around testing their chromosomes or whatever. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really a, a wise way to to put that. And I think just to sum up, I wonder if one way to sort of, 
um, summarize some of these comments is it, it seems to me that if we are always asking, um, well, what about testing sex for this or testing this and testing this with sex, right? Imagining that that's an important heuristic, we're probably missing other points of human comparison that might actually be more valuable, right? Like what if this particular, you know, medical question or, or legal question is actually more operant between different types of a population or within a certain population. But we can't see that if we're always asking, is this sex linked? Is this actually sort of derivative of this M or F formation? So it might even lead to, um, if we don't imagine that the baseline of human sorting, right, is M versus F, we're probably going to have more interesting scientific questions that actually could leave, lead to more scientific innovation because we're not barking up the wrong tree all the time, right? With respect to thinking that things have to be necessarily sexually dimorphic in order to be relevant. Um, so I, I think it's a really interesting way to, to think um, not just, you know, about the sort of practical matter of paperwork, but also to think sort of the large horizon of human experience um, you know, if we aren't always cycling back to what does F mean, what does M mean, we might get really creative and interesting types of scientific questions on some of the most urgent matters. And so sort of similar to this legal frame, right? Like we might discover the discrimination is operant in on multiple scales in a way that we can address it more precisely. We can actually be more justice minded um, if we aren't always asking, well, is this because that person had X type of gametes, right? <laughs> to your point, that isn't necessarily what's actually operating in the social. Um, I think that I'm meant to close this out at um, 10 to three. Um, so I'm gonna let people wrap, but I really appreciate this conversation. I appreciate the um, directness and clarity of this conversation and its um, you know, groundedness in the real world. So thank you so much for, for this. Thank you.